Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Super Circuit Bending Super Show. Well, in this specific video, what I'm going to be doing is designing and building a digitally controlled glitch video mixer. What that means is I'm going to be doing a digital version of a super simple glitch mixer where you take two video signals and basically just smash them together. And then by changing the relative resistance between the signals and the output, you generate a kind of botched up video signal um, made by kind of colliding the two together. Now, the reason I'm doing this digitally is I want to bring in an audio signal and I could find a way to do that just kind of analog. But I really like the idea of putting together a framework to use an Arduino and that way even if you're not using an audio signal, say you want to use like a distance sensor or something like that, you can use all sorts of different inputs to control a glitch video mixer. Now, the simplest way to do this would be to use a single uh, digital potentiometer um, in the 1K range. Um, those do exist. They're called, uh, they're labeled X9C102P. But the only ones I have on hand are 103p which means these are um, 10k potentiometers you know, if i had a 1k potentiometer i could do it like a normal glitch mixer right where i have two video signals come in then the wiper is the output signal and as i adjust back and forth that relatively low resistance is appropriate for a video signal however because i only have these 10k ones on hand we're going to be using two potentiometers that way, instead of swinging back and forth through the whole possible range of resistance, we're basically only going to use the first 10% uh, or so. But depending on how this video does, slash if there's any interest, I will make a follow-up video, kind of an updated design using that more appropriate value, if, uh, if folks think that would be interesting. If you want to see that, definitely let me know in the comments. Um, That'll definitely be encouraging if uh, if I should go ahead and do a follow up. The first thing we're going to do is get the hardware wired up. I'm going to break this apart into steps. The first thing I'm going to do is just do very basic control of a single potentiometer. What I'm doing, I'm just laying out my potentiometer and my Arduino. You can see I preemptively just put a little capacitor in my power rail to smooth things out. I don't think these potentiometers are especially picky about that, but um, it's always good practice just to have a little bit of power filtering. First thing I'm going to do is just go ahead and run my power and ground wires. For testing at least, I'm just going to be running everything off of USB power. I find that to be easier because that way the USB is already hooked up for programming. That's the power and ground hooked up. So when the USB power comes in, I'll be supplying it to this rail. We just need to supply that power over here. A pin number, uh, pin numbers, if you're not already familiar, are a little weird. They start with this little dimple. They go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is pin number eight, power supply. And number four is our ground connection. So I'm just getting a longer bit of wire here to bring that up and around. If you've seen my videos before, you know I am not a very clean and tidy breadboarder. Next thing we need to do, there are three connections that go between the Arduino and this little digital potentiometer. And those are referred to as increment, up, down, and chip select. And I'm not going to lie, I'm not an expert, and I'm probably not the person you want trying to define all those terms and why they're called that. So long story short, using those three pieces of information, those three controls, the Arduino will be able to adjust this potentiometer. The first one is increment. That's going to be pin one on our potentiometer. And just to match up to our example, it's going to be pin two on our Arduino. Next is our up-down pin. 
and two on this chip. That's going to be pin 15 here on our Arduino. And finally, we've got our chip select pin. That's going to go to pin 7 on the potentiometer and pin 16 on the Arduino. Those are the three control pins hooked up to so the last pins here. We've got basically the two sides and the wiper. How they refer to that on this digital potentiometer is this pin is called high, so the high end of the potentiometer. Directly opposite, you have low. So those are the two sides of the potentiometer. And then here on pin five, you have the wiper. That's kind of the middle selector. As it moves, it's changing resistance um, between this wiper and the high and low points. Okay, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the code on this one, because in this sketch I'm really just using a sample to test out this potentiometer. But just to kind of give a quick overview, basically how this works, I'm plugging in a number between 0 and 99 that sets basically the wiper position of this potentiometer, and that kind of changes the resistance between the wiper and the high and low points. All I'm going to use the sketch to do is run a few different numbers in and get an idea of what basically what values I want to use for a video signal. I know from building other glitch mixers that a resistance of you know 1k overall, so about 500 ohms in either direction, so really low resistance is typically what we want for a video signal. So right now I've got this number running at 10. So you can see at 10 I get uh, 1.5k between my low end and wiper. And what the low and high end means is the low end, if the number is set to zero, the resistance is at its lowest between low and wiper. Whereas at zero, the resistance is highest between high and wiper. Now I'm going to update that number to five and we'll see what happens. We should see some blinking lights here as the code starts to go in. There we go. And you can see at 5, we roughly cut our resistance in half. So we are now reading about 800 ohms. And I've just been jotting some numbers down to trace this. Um, so I'll show my work there. And next, I'm going to run it at 3. Now we are running at 0. And you can see we've got about 165 ohms. So that's kind of the baseline resistance of the wiper. Um, so that's to be expected, that it would never go to truly zero. And what I'm going to try to do next is just to kind of fine tune this a little bit. I'm going to add in a parallel resistor. That will help me kind of knock this volume down since I'm really only using the bottom 10% of the spread. I think that may help. I'm going to start another set of notes. Four with four seventy um, zero. We have one hundred and twenty two ohms. So that brings our total maximum down by you know, about forty ohms. Not too bad. In case you're not familiar, you can use R um, instead of the ohm symbol when you're talking about just uh, ohms. I'm not sure in my head R always meant like regular so it's not like 10k like 10,000 ohms R is just to let you know hey I didn't forget a modifier it's 358 um, so you may see myself and other folks use these two interchangeably but anyhow at a value of 10 we've got about 358 ohms 15 I've got about 386 ohms So you can see now I've got much finer control using this um, instead of, you know, when I went from 10 to 15 here at 1.5k and 2.1k. 
instead I'm only moving at about 30 ohms here. So this is much better for video signals. This is much more what I want to see. Four to six weeks later. I just wanted to take a second to go over the final hardware here. I'll show a schematic up on screen to make it easier to follow along with um, and show the final product here. And after actually reading the library I was using. I was supposed to be using pull-up resistors, so I put pull-up resistors here on the connections going to pin 2, as well as the one going to pin 16. And again, that's referenced in the code. I just didn't read it the first time around. Uh, whoops. Um, so hopefully that will stabilize things. I made a quick tweak to the code as well. I thought I was being more efficient by only sending pot values when a change was detected, but uh, either I wrote that code incorrectly or something but that was causing some of the weird behavior I saw in the pot where it would get hung up at the wrong end of the spectrum. So I've got that bug fixed as well on the code side. And the last thing I did, I added this control potentiometer here, and this adjusts what I'm calling sensitivity. So basically there is a floor volume level that has to happen before the pop value changes. And turning this knob will actually change what that value is. It seems like a useful feature in a lot of different setups, but especially the one that I'm kind of designing this for. Anyway, that should cover the hardware side of this. The last thing we're going to do is basically hook up some test video signals and make sure it actually works. Before I jump into testing, let's uh, run through code really quickly. Um, this is all on GitHub, so you don't have to try to like jot this down super quick or anything like that. Um, but I just want to give a little bit of context for what's going on here on the software side. So here we just define all the different variables. Um, you can read through that. I tried to label what all of them mean. And the setup, really all we're doing here is setting up our digital potentiometer and establishing what three pins we're using for communication, uh, like we talked about earlier on the hardware side. Here we're just declaring that in the software, and there's really not much to this code here in the loop. The first thing we're going to do, we're going to read in the audio level from the audio pin that we defined earlier. And then what we're going to do, because audio is a waveform that goes both positive and negative, we're going to use absolute value to make sure that number's always positive. Now, if we were doing something fancy, we would probably need to do something fancier than this, since we just want a simple number representing the amplitude or signal strength of our audio signal just putting it in absolute value and turning both the peaks and the valleys into positive numbers will work just fine for us. And you'll notice here I have subtracting a value called the bias. And if you're familiar at all with the uh, audio stuff, basically bias is just a fancy way of adjusting the zero point. Like we said, it's a wave that goes up and down, positive and negative, but life being what it is, the waveform is never going to be truly zeroed out um, unless you're operating in like perfect conditions. What bias does is it kind of forces your zero level to the center of that waveform and we get it an accurate number kind of reflecting the amplitude of that wave. The next step here we're just reading in the position of our sensitivity knob and we're setting a threshold based on wherever that knob is turned to. Then down here, this is the actual meat of the code, where basically we're saying, okay, if our amplitude level is higher than the sensitivity threshold we've set, then it's going to go ahead and send a value to the digital potentiometer. And we're gonna map that value so that the louder the signal is, the more it's going to change the potentiometer value. That way, instead of a simple like on off, we're actually going to be changing the amount of resistance relative to the amount of audio signal. Now, if it's below our threshold level, we're going to set it to what I've called the static level. In my case, we just use zero, um, so the low point. But if we wanted to, for instance, have it in the midpoint and go up or down from there, but we can change this static value to do that. And basically this last little line 
actually sends the value over to our potentiometer to adjust it. And this block here, this is all just uh, console logging so that you can look at what it's doing for testing purposes. And then finally, the last thing it does is it just has a little bit of a delay before it runs the code all over again. Because these little microcontrollers can run super duper fast, uh, putting a delay in there keeps your potentiometer from, from trying to operate way too quickly. I've got it set here to 100 milliseconds. Um, to make it super duper responsive but i think when i was playing around with it anywhere between 100 and 300 milliseconds worked pretty darn good super simple code and um I meant to say this at first but i think i forgot i'm not like a code person so this code probably sucks but it is free so um, all this is on github with the schematics and stuff like that if you want to build one of these now it's the fun part of the video where we actually have to test out our work and see if it you know works uh, before I talk through the testing setup here, I did just want to take a moment to say thank you so much to everyone who subscribed to the channel recently. Um, subscribing to the channel, commenting, liking videos, it's all a really huge help. So thanks to the folks who are doing that, and uh, a special thank you to the folks that do that after watching this video. I really appreciate it. Let's talk about this testing rig. The one I've got here, I've got two of these little media players. Uh, the other one's off camera here and those are supplying my two video signals now one you can see here i've just got a looping gif of some fire and the other one that you can't see right now because the pot is kind of all the way adjusted towards this one and the other one that's on the opposite side of the pot that one is playing a loop of some like glitchy color bars that we'll see in just a second with any luck. And for the audio what i've done is i've run the headphone output from my mixer into our setup here. So as I turn up the headphone volume, we should start seeing it react to my voice. Ideally, it'll swap between this fire GIF and the signal glitches. As I turn it up, okay, we can start to see something. We can start to see, okay. So that is right about where I'd expect the volume to be. You can see as I'm talking, it's swapping the signal more heavily over towards the glitch. And as I stop talking, it's dropping back. One, two. Check one, two, one, two, one, two. As you can see, it's occasionally getting really confused and throwing up this little yellow bar. That's because this is a digital monitor, so it's trying really hard to interpret this really messy, mangled analog signal and display it digitally. If you've ever played with glitch video before, you know that you get best results with a CRT or something that doesn't have to do any kind of digital conversion. But even so, especially on a digital display, this is super responsive. 